Well, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Liz Kirchhoff and I'm an adult services librarian at the Barrington Area Library. Um, and we'd like to welcome you to this program offered with our partners at the Chicago Living Corridors. Before we begin today, um, we have a couple of housekeeping notes for you. Uh, please mute your microphones and keep those muted during our program tonight. Um, and if you have questions, you can use the chat box at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll save a little bit of time at the end for any questions that come on in. Uh, we will be recording this program, um, as you heard, uh, and that should be available for you to view uh, next week sometime. I'll send that link out to everyone. Um, now I'd like to go ahead and introduce Peggy Simonson. Peggy has been a volunteer with Citizens for Conservation for 16 years. She is a former president of CFC and continues to serve on the board of directors. Peggy is currently chair of the CFC's Community Education Committee. Peggy. Thanks, Liz. I'm pleased to have you all join us tonight, and we're very grateful, as always, to the Barrington Area Library to host these programs we've been doing monthly. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Chicago Living Corridors for those of you who don't know about us. Chris, if you would uh, move the slide to the next one. There we go. Chicago Living Corridors is a uh, an umbrella organization with the mission of focusing on private property ownership. Uh, we, we collaborate with conservation groups like the forest preserves that are publicly owned, but so much of our land, as you see, is in private ownership. And so we're really trying to focus on improving habitat in the greater Chicago area uh, on private property. This map is a screenshot of our website. On our website, we have uh, the different dots, the colored dots are represented of the, the various organizations that are members of CLC. Uh, and and <clears throat> as you see, they're sort of geographic areas. Each of those groups, and I'll talk about who they are in just a minute, but uh, work in a particular area. And, and consequently, uh, if you are interested in, if you have good habitat on your property and would like to get a dot on the map, you don't come directly to us, you'll go to one of the organizations that represents the area you live in. So all of that's interactive on the website. You can check out and see which is which and who, who's where. Next slide. As I said, we're an umbrella organization. And we, the founding organizations a few years ago uh, were all of whom are organizations that have active programs to help individuals improve habitat on their property. I'm with Citizens for Conservation, as Liz said. We have a program called Habitat Corridors, which advises primarily homeowners, but other private property owners on improving habitat. Carol Rice, who's the president of Chicago Living Corridors, is with the WPPC, the, uh, it's McHenry County Wildflower Propagation and Preservation Committee, and their program is called A Natural Garden in Your Yard, which is a, a similar, uh, actively helping individuals improve uh, habitat. Uh, and also uh, the one that's a little hard to see, but that's the Conservation Foundation that has the program of Conservation Foundation, um, Conservation at Home, uh, which is uh, a license to a number of other uh, conservation organizations, so pretty prevalent around the Chicago area. And then all, one of the other, two of the other founders were Wild Ones chapters, the uh, West, uh, Northern Cane and West Cook chapters. Since our founding, we've had additional uh, organizations join us. All of these on the list here are those that are actively working to help improve uh, habitat and private property. So now next slide. What we, if you are interested in, if you have good habitat already um, and would like to get on your, your dot on the map, join one of the participating organizations. Uh, if you are just starting, we want you to plant natives and many of you I expect are already actively doing so, but we can always add to them and you're gonna get some good ideas from Chris today about which plants support which butterflies. Um, we also encourage volunteering with Chicago Living Corridors. If you're interested, uh, again, get onto the chicagolivingcorridors.org uh, website. All sorts of resources there. One of them, the, the great ones, is that we have had permission from most of our presenters in the last 18 months that we've been doing these uh, to record the programs, as Liz suggested, and we, we have those on the CLC website. So if you didn't see them, you're, you can go back and take a look at them, 
or if you did see them, but they're, you know, our, our presenters pack a lot of information into a program. So um, the same thing too is true with Chris's tonight. If you'd like to uh, go back and, and re-look at it or, or, or look more at, I'm sure he's, he's a wonderful photographer. So you're gonna see some great photos. But anyway, so uh, there's also a lot of other resources on chicagolivingcorridors.org. So do, do take a look at that. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight and our topic of butterfly host plants. Uh, you're going to learn how to attract butterflies to your home, to your home garden, by providing food sources and breeding grounds for our native butterflies and other pollinators. Chris will inspire you to incorporate beautiful native plant species in your home landscape and will discuss which host plants are specific to certain butterflies and other insects. Chris Benda is a botanist and past president of the Illinois Native Plant Society. Currently, he works as a researcher at Southern Illinois University, where he coordinates the Plants of Concern Southern Illinois program and teaches the flora of Southern Illinois. Besides working at SIU, he conducts botanical field work around the, around the world, but also in our area, teaches a variety of classes at the Morton Arboretum and leads nature tours uh, for camp Andesunk. Chris, you're going to have to tell us what, about that. We don't know about that, that camp. Chris is also uh, has research appointments at the University of Illinois and Argonne National Laboratory. So he's busy. But he's also an accomplished photographer and author of several publications about natural areas in Illinois. So he is known as the Illinois botanizer. So we're delighted to have Chris join us today from Southern Illinois. Chris? Great. Thank you, Peggy, for the introduction. And thank you to Chicago Living Corridors for inviting me to speak about butterfly host plants. And here on the cover slide, we can see a greater spangled fritillary on, of course, the butterfly milkweed. So again, my name is Chris Benda. And as of January, I started full time at uh, SIU, Southern Illinois University, to coordinate the Plants of Concern program. So many of you may be aware of this program. It's been run out of the Chicago Botanic Garden for 20 years. We're actually celebrating the 20th anniversary this year. And uh, just in January, they were able to expand the program to Southern Illinois. And so I spend my days um, either doing rare plant monitoring on my own with my assistant or coordinating with volunteers to find these plants in the wild. Uh, also, I mentioned to teach the floor of Southern Illinois. This last summer was my 10th year teaching that class at SIU, uh, past president of Native Plant Society. And I'm also a life member and I still edit the newsletter. I'm actually uh, working on wrapping up the fall issue here in the next few days. So I do um, a variety of other things. So I have an appointment with Argonne uh, National Laboratory and I actually have field work in Hawaii that I get to go to. And they actually sent me to Korea in 2019. That's where I get to boast that I work around the world. Um, but Camp Ondesong, as you mentioned earlier, is a Catholic youth camp in Johnson County near the town of Ozark, Illinois. And I lead nature tours for them. Uh, or I did, I should say, uh, pre-pandemic. That, that program has not been uh, revived since um, the pandemic started, um, but I hope to do that again sometime. That some of you may be familiar with the internationally uh, organization called Road Scholars, one called Elder Hostel, and they have programs in, in all over the place. And so I lead nature tours at Camp Ondesong, which includes the, uh, which on the site, they have the tallest waterfall in Illinois, which is really kind of exciting. Also, you can find me online as Illinois Botanizer. Of course, my website there is illinoisbotanizer.com. And I do all the social media. I post a lot to Facebook and Instagram, uh, but I have a blog as well. But I also would like to direct you to my website where I have a plants database. And um, there's no, over a thousand entries now on the website. Of, I've been living and botanizing in Illinois for 17 years. So I've amassed quite a collection of plant photos and trying to make those available to people on my website. And if you go to the bottom of the page, you can subscribe to the mailing list. I give um, 
a fair amount of presentations, tours, workshops, etc. And you can see this my schedule of events on the workshop, or if you want to be notified of them, you can enter your email there on the website and I'll send out email reminders of my program. So I think of myself as a natural areas ecologist and the natural areas are the INAI sites. And INAI stands for Illinois Natural Areas Inventory. And that was started in 1976. And a natural area then is an area of land that has retained or recovered its original natural character, but it need not be completely undisturbed. So these are the nat high quality natural community remnants that are uh, still intact as they were, have been, you know, for hundreds and thousands of years in Illinois. So we think of these as pristine grade A or nearly pristine grade B uh, natural communities that are in very high natural quality, very high natural condition. So the INAI was actually the first of its kind. <clears throat> you may be aware um, that George Fell um, developed the Illinois Nature Preserves law in the 1960s, and that allowed for protection of land by the landowner as a state law. And so that actually led to the inventory because now once they had a program to protect land, they needed to figure out, well, where are all the remnants that we wanna be aware of? Uh, so we may acquire them and save them as Illinois nature preserves. So that was really, Illinois was the first state to do that. And maybe because so much of Illinois has been converted to agriculture and other development that there, we really needed to get a handle on what we had remaining. So that was in 76 and they found after the sort of three year initial project to identify all the natural areas in the state that collectively just 0.07% of the entire state of Illinois was considered to be in a pristine or nearly pristine natural condition. So a very small amount. Actually, Iowa is the only state that has less of their land in the state as uh, in, in a natural condition. But that being said, we do have natural areas all over the state in every, each of the 102 counties of Illinois. So they're well dispersed. Um, and I bet there's one near where you live. Especially in the Northeast, there's all kinds of them. And then in the South, there's a lot as well, which you can see they're, they're scattered throughout the state. So an example of one of these natural area remnants is this picture here of Munson Township Cemetery Prairie Nature Preserve in Henry County. So here is a little piece, several acres, of the original undisturbed Illinois prairie. And you can see the gravestones there um, that are from some of the early you know, European inhabitants of the land. And that's why these prairies persisted. They were set aside for these burials in the 1800s and they were never plowed. And that's sort of the key factor for a prairie. Once you plow through a prairie, it will essentially never be the same again. You know, most of the prairie plant, or at least 50% of a prairie plant, is present underground as roots. And those roots, over time, they become, you know, they form a thick sod and um, they break down into very productive organic soil. And that's why we have some of the richest farmland in the world in Illinois, because of the prairie ecosystem. And of course, we've converted most of it to agriculture in Illinois. And we have just these little, you know, postage stamp sized remnants across the landscape like Munson Township. So if we zoom out here, we can see this is a picture of Munson Cemetery. And I think the site is about 20 acres or so, but the high quality portion of the site is just a few acres of undisturbed prairie. If we zoom out here, you can see this looks like a nice square box. You can see, you know, surrounded by roads and ditches. That's one section. And one section is 640 acres. So you can see the size of the cemetery remnant there in regards to the 640 acre section lines. And if we zoom out here, you can see lots of little squares, all those different sections. And Munson Cemetery, when we zoom out this far, is barely even recognizable on the map. But you can see the dot there. That's the little prairie that's persisting in this you know, giant uh, expanse of agriculture. So we've really relegated um, our natural areas to tiny little spots on the landscape. And that's why I like this quote by E.O. Wilson, famous Harvard ecologist who said, every scrap of biodiversity is priceless, never to be surrendered without a struggle. 
And of course, we have there pictured our own Illinois endemic species, the Kankakee mallow. Now, there's been some news going on of late that I'm sure many of you have heard uh, about regarding natural prairie and natural remnants. And that has to do with Bell Bowl Prairie in Rockford, Illinois. So the airport there has uh, planned an expansion. They are uh, mainly a cargo airport and they need to expand to serve clients like Amazon and UPS and others. And they, um, the airport board that decides these things um, basically came up with a plan that included bulldozing the high quality five acre gravel prairie present at the Rockford Airport called Bell Bowl Prairie. This prairie was actually, um, had faced destruction in the past and George Fell himself, Rockford resident, you know, he's founder of the Nature Conservancy, founder of the Natural Land Institute. He stood in front of bulldozers in the 1960s until the governor intervened and halted construction and was able to save Bell Bowl Prairie. So this site is very historic and it came up um, to be destroyed again. In fact, they were slated to just start um, construction November 1st. And you can see the picture here has the rusty patched bumblebee, which is a federally endangered species. And that was found on the site. And that's why construction was halted until November 1st when the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, determines that the, the bees uh, hibernate. And it's a long story. I'm sure many of you have followed it. But I just heard today, um, that the airport board decided to halt construction and they're going to revisit their plan. So this is a huge uh, deal, a big win for the proponents of uh, those of us who want to save Bell Bowl Prairie. So it looks like, at least in the short term, we bought some time to do some more advocacy um, to make sure that this rat natural remnant is protected. There's only uh, something like 80 some acres of high quality gravel prairie in the entire state that's left in a high quality condition. So to plow over five acres would, is just unacceptable. Uh, in fact, five acres is just part of it. The whole thing is about 20. So in this day and age in, in Illinois and elsewhere, you know, we shouldn't be destroying our natural community remnants. So, so far so good. It seems that there's some protection coming for Bell Bowl, but stay informed on this issue. In fact, I'm going to be driving up um, to Rockford tomorrow to give a talk on Saturday about this um, exact initiative. So that'll be exciting. Okay, so into the heart of the presentation here, Illinois is a diverse state. We have approximately 3,600 vascular plant species that are found statewide, many of them quite showy and beautiful. And we're, the state is divided into 14 natural divisions. And so the point I want to make with this slide is that if you're looking to plant natives in your home landscape or on your property, you want to consider where in Illinois you're located. Because something that's uh, native in southern Illinois, but not found in the northern part of the state, may not be as appropriate for your landscape versus something that's in southern Wisconsin and vice versa. Um, so plants are you know, adapted to the environment in the location where they evolve. And so you want to use plants that are native in the region where you live. So I'm down here, I'd say I'm in number 13, that's the Shawnee Hills uh, right now. Um, and of course, most of you all are up in number three, the Northeastern Moreno. So consider where you live when you're choosing native plants. Okay, and then I just kind of little preaching to the choir here, quick slides on about why should we use native plants. And I, I think of this quote that I really like, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And so the idea here is that these plants have evolved over hundreds and thousands of years in this exact location with interactions with the soil and the microbes and the fungi and the climate and the humidity and all those different factors. So it's, it's, um, they're, they belong in that place. They've developed there over a long period of time. So they're adapted to the local conditions. And of course, you don't, you're not gonna get native wildlife if you don't have native plants, right? There's a symbiosis happening here between wildlife and plant life. And so planting native plants will support native wildlife. 
And then, you know, over time, once these perennial plants get established, they should be less maintenance, you know, than like planting annuals every year or something, uh, and then cheaper as well. So some strategies, I, I should give a caveat here. I spend all my time in the wild looking at plants and appreciating plants and admiring them. So I am not a gardener. Um, the house plants we do have, or my wife takes care of those. So I do not have a real green thumb, but uh, so I'm probably telling you things you already know, but some strategies for planting would be colors. You, know, you wanna have a variety of different colors of the wildflowers that occur in your landscape. Bloom time, so we wanna have things blooming all times of the year. So you gotta consider when are plants blooming. You wanna choose them. So there's always something in bloom. You want to select species that are adapted for the soil and the light. So essentially it's you know wet or dry soil versus sunny or shaded conditions. And then I always like to remind people, don't forget about the ferns and the grasses and the shrubs. You know, we're always drawn to forbs and showy wildflowers, but we have these other groups of plants that are also useful to incorporate in your property. And then think about climate change effects. You know, um, we see this already in Southern Illinois, a lot of plants are moving north. Plants that didn't used to be in Southern Illinois or were rare are becoming more common because you know things are shifting. Um, and the climate in Illinois, it's getting warmer and wetter. So again, six native plants, can't stress that enough. Look for native plants. And even within um, obtaining a native plant, if you really wanna be a purist about it, you wanna consider where the seed source comes from. So you want what we call local ecotype seed. And that means that even though say cardinal flower um, is native in the United States and in Illinois, you know, you'd be better off purchasing seed that originated from a population within 100 miles from where you live versus seed from, you know, Minnesota or, you know, another state. Now, that's often hard to do. We don't have a lot of sources for seed. So I, I would say that at the very uh, basic level, incorporate plants that are native to North America and ideally plants that are native to Illinois, and then even more preferably, if possible, plants that are local ecotype, come from a po plant population in the wild within 100 miles from your home. And that's just you know, an arbitrary number, but you, you understand the point, I'm sure. So here's some guidebooks about, um, for plant identification. Um, I actually studied turtles in graduate school. I went to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and I worked in Lake County for the Lake County Forest Preserve District. Um, finding uh, Blanding's turtles. And so I taught myself plants in graduate school and I used Newcomb's wildflower guide a lot to learn plants. But we also have Illinois wildflowers. And then in Southern Illinois, I like this uh, wildflowers of Tennessee and the Ohio Valley. So there's some sort of pretty picture, you know, more of a lay person approach to plant ID. But if you want to get the technical manuals that are comprehensive, that have all the wild occurring plants in your region. For the state, we have uh, Dr. Mullenbrock's vascular flora of Illinois. And then in the Chicago region, we have the somewhat newly released um, flora of the Chicago region by Jerry Wilhelm and Laura Barica. So those are amazing resources if you want a real deep dive into plant ID. And then if you're going to look at butterflies and skippers and moss and things, here are some excellent resources for Illinois. The Butterflies of Illinois is a wonderful publication that's not uh, too many years uh, old either. And then there's some older books about the skippers and the silk moths. So those are awesome resources we have specifically for Illinois and what we call these lepidopterans. Now, where to get seed or plants? Uh, on the Illinois Native Plant Society website, there is a tab that has a a list of the native plant nurseries that are present in Illinois. Of course, there's a lot of them in the Northeast region where a lot of people live, um, but we have some listed there statewide. So that's a good source to look at for obtaining uh, native plants. Our website at illinoisplants.org. And one last thing here about nativars. So we have native species that have been cultivated and bred, you know, selectively bred to be you know, showier or bloom longer or various characteristics. And most native plant societies are um, recommending against nativars, essentially because they're manipulated. 
there have been you know, selected and chosen and bred specifically for one thing or another. And so ideally we wanna have true native species that originated from the wild and have not been manipulated by uh, cultivation. And you can find a lot of statements and articles that talk about native ours. So I want you to be aware of that uh, situation. All right, so let's talk about some butterflies a little bit and get into the heart of the presentation. So of course, butterflies have a life cycle and like a lot of invertebrates, they actually have a larval stage. It looks you know, much different than the adult stage. Um, and the true thing is true for butterflies. So as we look at these plants, most the plants that are specific to certain butterflies are actually specific to the caterpillars or the egg stage. So butterflies themselves are generalists and they will visit a variety of wildflowers. Of course, they want to get nectar and things, energy, food. And so there are only particular plants that they'll lay their eggs on because then the eggs hatch into the caterpillar, the larvae, and then they'll consume the plant. And some are very picky about what they'll only eat a certain thing. So when we're talking about selection of plants for specific butterflies, we're actually referring to the caterpillars that are specific to the plants. And there's a quick mention, you know, Doug Tallamy, who's a, who's a, a, a entomologist, he studies caterpillars. And so a lot of his books about native plants relate to, to native caterpillars and, you know, things like oaks and black cherry and such, they can have over 500 species of caterpillars that are specific to them. So you're really creating a uh, a wonderful uh, environment for, for butterflies to use when you plant native plants. And I should mention, even though I'm gonna talk about some specific examples, um, anything you have that's native is gonna be visited by butterflies and pollinators. So you plant native plants, you get native wildlife. But we wanna discuss some plants that are specific to certain things. And I wanna start here with some of the butterflies that are rare in Illinois. So wild lupin, is uh, not commonly found. It's a pea in the pea family. Um, I actually spent one of my first summers while I was in my undergraduate degree working at Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, where they had a lot of wild lupin. And they have, because they had a lot of wild lupin, they have the, the butterfly that's host for it is uh, the Carner blue butterfly. Beautiful little small blue butterfly. And so they had a good population there at the Fort McCoy. And so a bunch of us you know, spent almost the whole summer walking in transects, mapping on the, on the, on the site, uh, 60,000 acres where all the wild lupin occurs. So that was an interesting project because the, the Carner Blue is very rare. It's actually a federally um, listed species. And so it needs wild lupin for regeneration. Now we also have this neat plant called swamp thistle. I know thistles sometimes get a bad reputation because you have some non-native ones and they, they're considered weeds to some, they invade your yard and et cetera. Um, but we have many uh, fairly conservative thistles in Illinois, like the swamp thistle, Circium muticum. And this thistle, as the name implies, it likes wet areas, it likes high quality fence. So this is a, a one you're gonna find, you know, yeah, in our natural areas. And underneath the flowers there, which we call the involucre, it's like a dark gray color here. On this species, it's very sticky, very viscous. So that's one way that's uh, you know, easy to identify the swamp thistle. You just touch the involucre, it's very sticky. And it, this plant is not as sharp and spiny and painful as uh, some of the other thistles like um, the common field thistle and the, the you know, Circium vulgari and some ones like that. But the rare butterfly that associates with this plant is the swamp metal mark. It's also rare in Illinois. You see the photo here by Doug Terran, who works a lot with butterflies. Now grasses too, we don't want to think, you know, forget about grasses. They're not real showy plants, but there are lepidopterans that utilize grasses like uh, big blue stem and broom sedge and such. And so we have a lot of the skippers utilize tall grasses. So a skipper is, you know, similar to a butterfly. They're all lepidopteran, but, you know, it's in a little different of a, a grouping. They have some morphological differences. But this skipper here is one of the rare ones in Illinois. 
So some grasses in your landscape will be good for our native skippers. Now here's a cool plant, the rattlesnake master. It's an iconic prairie plant I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It has leaves that are very fibrous, like the yucca leaves, hence the name yucca folium. It's saying foliage like yucca, is the translation there. And on the rattlesnake master is a rare um, moth, actually, that we call, oh, let me, let me tell you this story first. Um, in Southern Illinois, at a site in Union County, there was a researcher studying pack rats. And he found a pack rat nest underneath a sort of a, a rock shelter that had collapsed, collapsed. And he collected some materials from the pack rat nest and he found a, a slipper sandal artifact there. And he noted in his report and you know, filed it away and an archeologist saw the report and found the shoe box or whatever that had the, the materials that he had found and got this uh, sandal analyzed. And it was found that the sandal was made out of 5,000 year old rattlesnake master fibers found in Southern Illinois. So that's a really fascinating story about this uh, interesting plant with the leaves like a yucca. But as I was saying, there's this rare stem borer moth, uh, Pepima, Pepapima, as I would say it, and it's specific to Eurygium yuccafolium. So um, if you see, you know, Rattlesnake Master, you can investigate it for this Rattlesnake Master stem borer, which is a rare insect in Illinois. Oh, and I want to thank Bill Glass here for the photo of that rare animal, which I have never observed myself. I hope to someday. So some other, um, oh, this is one more rare, rare butterfly that utilizes bird's foot violet, Viola pedata. So there's something like 30 species of violets in Illinois, a lot. But the bird's foot violet is a, is a prairie species, and it has a distinct leaves. And you can see, I took this picture at Ayers Sand Prairie. Uh, nature preserve and you see a nice mass bloom of the birds with violet and the butterfly that utilizes that is the rare regal fritillary and i also have not uh, seen and photographed this this uh, rare butterfly yet but i hope to someday so most of the photos in this presentation are mine but you can see um, where i have acknowledgement for photos that are not so regal fritillary there is on the bird's foot violets now, because I mentioned fritillary and mentioned that there's another more common species, the greater spangled fritillary, and they seem to use a variety of species. It was on the butterfly milkweed in the photo at the cover. This is purple milkweed that this one's on. So apparently they like, they like their milkweeds like a lot of butterflies do. But that's a more common uh, fritillary in the state. Now, some other host plants for butterflies. We have the white turtle head. Chelone glabra. Chelone is Latin for turtle. And you see the flowers there. They sort of resemble the shape of a turtle's head. And these grow in fens and you know, wet places, seats and things. And it's the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. You can see there the caterpillar and butterfly that um, utilize this species for their survival. Very beautiful butterfly there indeed. And I, I, I'm not sure if they're actually listed anymore. I think they might not be, but they are rare still. So that would be a butterfly you might definitely want to um, plant some turtle head for to benefit them. And turtle head is a, you know, widely, uh, a widespread plant in Illinois. And it's somewhat easy to obtain, I believe. And we actually have a pink turtle head as well. Down south here where I live, we more commonly have um, the pink turtle head, although we do have the white as well. So a couple of options there for turtle heads and the Baltimore checker spot. Goat's beard is another one, not a very showy plant. It's a dioecious species, which means that an individual is either male or female. And so there's a nice specimen here in the photo, the Aruncus dioecus. Dioecus, it refers to that being dioecious. And what uh, inhabits that is the dusky azure which I also have never seen, but uh, apparently must not be very common because <clears throat> um, Sue Post and Mike Jeffords asked me once about finding goat's beard 
in Southern Illinois because they wanted to photograph the dusky azures. So they're specific to that plant. And that's a night, you know, the goat's beard is a gorgeous plant. I think anyway, I'm always very excited when I find some in the wild, not very common in Illinois, but it's, it's around. So that's a good association there. Now here's just a few plants that are generally good for all kinds of pollinators, but butterflies included. And one here is the New Jersey tea, Ceanothus americanus. They have lovely white blooms, a little kind of a shrubby, short shrub um, plant, but it's used by a variety of different insects. So that's a, a good one to know about. And if you weren't aware, I actually learned that this year that during the Boston Tea Party days, they threw all the tea overboard right, in the re revolt of the British Empire and they didn't have any tea. So they actually um, used the, this plant to make tea. And of course, uh, you know, a lot of it sort of in and around New Jersey. So that's how they got the name New Jersey Tea. You can make a tea from this plant. And it's actually in the Ramnaceae, which is the buckthorn family. I know buckthorn is a you know an invasive species in Chicago land, so that's not desirable. But this is a native member of the buckthorn family. Also, coneflowers, echinacea. We have several species in the state. Butterflies love echinacea, and so that is a useful plant to have in a full sun, dry setting in your landscape. We also have blazing stars. Butterflies love blazing star. This is Liatris spicata, but I think there's about a dozen species of Liatris in Illinois. So they provide uh, nectar for lots of things, bees and hoverflies and monarchs, particularly monarch butterflies, uh, often found nectaring on blazing star. And it's a beautiful plant as well. So that's a good one to think about. Oh, and here's a story. So a friend of mine, has incorporated a lot of native plants on his 40 acres in Jackson County. And he noticed his um, little wiener dog that they let run around. They call it the vole master because the dog goes after voles and it found a vole nest. And he went over there to investigate and the voles were taking the corum. The corum is like the root, the rootstock of the liatris plant and they're nutritious. And so the vole was stealing these corms from Liatris. And so he, his dog found this, you know, bowl nest and he excavated it himself and he pulled out like 500 corms that this bowl had stashed of his Liatris that he had planted and they were stolen, you know, and, and, and he went and he planted them back around uh, on his landscape. But, you know, these gold a corum is, I don't know, dollar, two, three dollars each if you were to buy them from a plant nursery. So, that bowl is stashed away, you know, $1,500 worth of uh, liatris corms in the little nest. So that was quite an interesting story we shared a few years ago. Uh, wild bergamot is another really easy plant to grow. This is common in restorations and such. And, and again, lots of butterflies will use the various monarda species like this monarda fistulosa, wild bergamot. And white wild indigo bush, another good pollinator plant. You know, it's kind of a taller plant. It's in the bee family, Baptisia alba is one of the synonyms for this. You know, a lot of the plant names are changing rapidly, it seems, but Baptisia alba is the name for this. And the cool story here is that if you, this is a pea, so it makes a big legume, a pea pod, and there's lots of seeds inside. And often if you open them up and get seeds, you see that a lot of seeds are, have been, are gone. They've been eaten by weevils. These weevils like to eat the seeds in there. So what you do, this is a Floyd Swink joke. You get two weevils, one bigger than the other weevil, and you put them on your hand and you say to the group, you see how this weevil is smaller than this weevil? It's the lesser of two weevils. Well, Floyd Swink was quite the punster, jokester. I think he would have got along just fine. So another plant here, very good for butterflies, is um, Dutchman's Pipe, Aristolochia tomentosa. We actually have um, another pipe vine, Aristolopia serpentaria, or endotica, if you're up to date on the very, uh, the new updated nomenclature. So pipe vine and Dutchman's pipe are host plant for the pipe vine swallowtails. And there's a picture of the caterpillar, the pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar on pipe vine. So that's a good one there to have. And of course, there's the adult, 
you can see the, the swallow tail projections there coming off the wing, hence the name. So pipe vine, swallow tails around pipe vine, Dutchman's pipe. Spice bush, we have a bunch of swallow tails that are specific to some things like the spice bush swallow tail butterfly and caterpillar. And this is the caterpillar that at one stage of its um, growth, it looks like bird poop. And so it's sitting on a leaf and it's all, you know, it, it camouflaged. And then later, as it gets a little bit larger, it has these, um, you know, fake predatory eyes. So it looks like a snake or some kind of, you know, larger creature that, that may be in, more intimidating. So of course, these have evolved these patterns because it helps them um, avoid predation. And there we have the, the spice bush there. Now, pawpaw, a similar triloba, is another excellent plant for a variety of reasons. Of course, it has the delicious fruit that it's produced, but also, um, oh, it's another, another uh, post plant for the swallowtail butterfly. And like the zebra swallowtail, which I have this just poor picture of this caterpillar, but there's one that I've seen back at some point in my history. So, more swallowtail associations. And there's the adult white and black there with the, again, the, the swallowtail feature coming off the wing. So just gonna have those on that. And then tiger swallowtails, it's another swallowtail in Illinois. And we actually have giant swallowtails as well. And so the, the, those are gonna be on prickly ash. You can see this photo here, which is more of a shrub. Uh, yeah, that's the host plant for the giant swallowtail. And there's the picture of the one of the, the caterpillars in early in development, where they kind of look like a bird dropping. And so that's its camouflage there to escape predation in the giant swallowtail. Now carrots, the carrot family, also host for um, some specific uh, caterpillars and butterflies. This picture here is great angelica, uh, or I'm sorry, not the wood, wood angelica. And, um, Angelica venenosa, photographed in my yard. But we have black swallowtail again that likes to, um, or the host plant, you know, rears its young on this particular species. So black swallowtails, they're on different carrots. Often people have wild dill that they've planted in their yard, that attracts these black swallowtails. So there's a whole series of swallowtail caterpillars and butterflies that are specific to a number of different plants. Let's move on to figwort family here. And this particular figwort is Agalinus, which is the slender purple false foxglove. And a caterpillar I see a lot on this particular species is the common buckeye. And so you see the caterpillar there, picture on the left, and the butterfly on the right for the common buckeye, which feeds on Agalinus species, which are the false foxglove, the purple false foxgloves. And there's, there's a number of different species in Illinois for those. Now, hoary vervain is another sort of weedy species that's you know common along roadsides and old fields. And again, it, butterflies love to feed and visit with the hoary vervain, the verbena stricta. So sometimes they're just common plants we have in a landscape are valuable um, for our insects. Wild senna is another good. Um, pollinator plant for butterflies. Let's see, I think we have a couple species. I think we have Marilanica maybe on the, on the left and then Hepicarpa here on the right zoomed in. It's got the little bearded style. That's how you know it's Senna Hepicarpa. But we have the cloudless sulfur that is often found feeding on wild Senna. Senna used to be in the genus Cassia. Cassia Marilanica was a former name. But the cloud of sulfur associates them with this plant, Senna. Now we have uh, orchids. So this particular orchid is pollinated by hawk moths. So the hawk moth isn't really associating with this plant as far as rearing its young. But the, this orchid has a very long nectar spur. And so only certain species have long enough proboscis that they can get, you know, it down into the nectar tube. And while they're doing that, they get pollen all over themselves and carry it from plant to plant. 
Now the eastern prairie fringe orchids are quite rare and they often don't get pollinated. And so uh, here you can see a capsule of orchids. Orchids have tiny little dust-like seeds. So they're you know, ubiquitously spread throughout the uh, environment because they're spread by wind and there's thousands and thousands of little seeds. But orchids are quite rare because the seed lacks endosperm. It doesn't have energy to grow in the seed. So it has to land somewhere where it can develop an association with mycorrhizal fungi and actually steals nutrients or obtains nutrients from the fungi and it allows it to grow until it's big enough to photosynthesize and produce its own food. So that's interesting. And because they're somewhat rare and they don't always get pollinated, there's a method where you can transfer the polymnia using toothpicks. So sometimes volunteers go out by hand and they use toothpicks and they take the polymnia out, which is with a pollen bearing uh, structure, and then you know move it to other plants and other populations to allow for germination. So that's a real sort of interesting method used to help our native rare orchids like the federally threatened eastern prairie fringed orchid. So now we have a few moths. You know, moths are a little typically uh, drabber in color and they're not as showy and beautiful, but they're important. Uh, Lepidopterans as well, like the Pandora sphinx moth here is hanging out on Virginia creeper. And this, these seems like they have a quite variation. They can come in a number of different colors. This one's sort of a brownish with this white spots on it. And this I just found uh, last month. Uh, the Plants of Concern team from Northern Illinois were down visiting and we took them out to a cypress swamp. And we were wading through thigh deep water that had, we saw six cotton mouths that day. And we were looking for the rare Styrax Americana, the American snowbell bush. And we encountered actually this plant I'd never seen before. It's called Ludwigia um, leptocarpa, which is the hairy primrose willow. And on it was a specific caterpillar that uses plants in the Onagraceae, which is the primrose family, the primrose. Uh, uh, the purple willows. Anyway, very showy, very large uh, caterpillar specific to this family of plants. So that was the first time seeing this caterpillar and this plant. That was very exciting out there in the swamp, catching that one. And then luna moths are, you know, more conspicuously patterned with the green colors there. Luna moss um, only live for about a week. So the adults have no mouth parts. They don't need to eat. They, you know, metamorphose in from a caterpillar to the moth and they mate and they die. That's their strategy. So uh, the luna moths are very large and, and showy lepidopterans that you should be on the lookout for. Now a butterfly magnet plant is button bush, Cephalanthus occidentalis. And this is a woody shrub. It likes wetlands. So shrub swamps and margins of ponds and you know, in, in the water, feet wet, you know, most of the year, if not the whole year. And they have these globose um, you know, flowers, flower heads. And you see the little protrusions that are sticking out of it. Those are the styles, right? The, the female portion of the plant is the stigma style ovary. So that's the style. So I would joke and say button bush is a plant that has a lot of style. So it's good to incorporate that in your home landscape. Butterflies love it. They also like marshmallow. So various hibiscus. We have, I think, three native hibiscus species in Illinois. They're quite large plants. So they get pretty tall. They like full sun. And they also like it where it's wet. They have these large flowers. And all, a lot of bee. There's a specific bee, I believe, that visits these. So lots of pollinators. But butterflies as well use the hibiscus plant. And then asters, of course. Asters used to be in the genus Aster, but uh, I say those pex, pesky taxonomists, they switched now. Most of the new world asters are in the Symphiotricum genus. Some uh, Ionactis or Eurybia, there's a few others, but most of them are in Symphiotricum. That's how we, we say it's how to faster master the aster disaster that asters are no longer classified in North America really as asters. But various pollinators and butterflies like them, like this picture is the heath aster. 
uh, Symbiotrichum ericoides. And moving on, lead plants, another awesome plant. Um, the dog face sulfur is one of the plants that will inhabit this particular one. Uh, oh, the gray hair streak is another one listed there. I don't have a picture of that, but mention those the like lead plant. Now, lead plant is not the easiest plant to grow. It, it's um, typically a, a indicator of you know remnant intact prairie and and such. But I know it has been put back on the landscape. It has these beautiful purple blooms, and it's really an awesome plant all around, and one that some butterflies also utilize. And then I want to mention some shrubs too that are good for pollinators and butterflies. The red spotted purple and the viceroy butterfly use service berry, Amelanchia arborea. And of course, these bloom in the early spring before trees have leafed out and they have these beautiful um, white blooms on them for the service berry. Black haw is a viburnum. We have a number of different viburnum species in Illinois, and they can host an array of butterflies and moths, including the holly blue butterfly, um, a silk moth, a sphinx moth, uh, the clear, the hummingbird clear wing moth. So they all host on viburnums during the caterpillar phase. And it is a beautiful flower. They don't last very long. I have a big clump of um, rusty black haw, which is viburnum uh, rufigulum that grows in front of my house and just huge blooms on them, but they last about a week, it seems. They're very fleeting, but they're quite gorgeous, the viburnum species. And then really late in the year, you can find witch hazels blooming. So the, the, the useful thing about witch hazel is a lot of plants are going dormant. Wildflowers are harder to find, but you know, in this time of year, late October and in November, you can find flowers on witch hazel, Amamellus virginiana, and that is the host plant for the spring azure butterfly, which is a fairly common uh, butterfly. It sort of looks like the Carner blues, small blue colored butterfly, as the name azure uh, implies. So the witch hazel, useful for that. And I thought I'd throw in a couple uh, ones that you want to look out for because you don't want to touch them. So caterpillars, you know, we saw on the, the swallowtails that they had, you know, evolved uh, camouflage for escaping predation. Well, these caterpillars will pack a painful sting if you brush up against them or touch them, like the stinging rose caterpillar we can see here. So you don't want to touch those. And also the saddleback moth caterpillar. So the moths don't look all that particularly showy, but the caterpillars are quite beautiful. Um, but this is one that I have several times accidentally brushed across a leaf with my hand and then, ooh, what is that? Ow, and it'll sting, you know? It's, it, it's kind of like a, you know, like a, like a stinging nettle sort of sensation, a little more severe and lasts a little longer, but you know, it wears off. But those are kind of neat looking caterpillars that you might want to avoid touching at least. Could say be good to see them and photograph them, just don't touch them. Pack a painful sting. Okay, so I'd like to end the presentation by talking about milkweeds, which of course are trending these days. We've got a lot of press and information about milkweeds. In fact, the um, Illinois Department of Natural Resources produced this poster a few years back. And they reached out to me and used a number of my photographs of milkweed for their milkweed poster. So I was honored to have photographs on that. And of course, the milkweeds are the host plant for the monarch butterfly. So we see a couple symmetrical uh, looking monarch butterflies on Liatris, which I, the blazing star, which I mentioned earlier, the magnet for monarchs. But the monarchs are looking for milkweed to lay their eggs because the caterpillars utilize milkweed for food when they're growing up. Now, milkweed contains a toxic um, latex, which is the milky sap, hence the name milkweed. And so this caterpillar has you know, special adaptations where it can ingest safely the toxic sap of the milkweeds. 
and they actually incorporate that toxin into their bodies. So monarch butterflies are toxic to other animals. Um, and that's one reason why possibly the viceroy butterfly is a mimic of the monarchs. They look similar, uh, but they're not toxic. And so predators learn to escape them. And so if you can't be toxic to yourself, well, look like something that is, and maybe that will help as well. So you can see the monarch caterpillar there phase on the swamp milkweed. So I thought I would end the presentation by going through quickly the 18 native species of milkweeds in Illinois, which is as in the genus Asclepius. So as we started the cover slide here with the butterfly milkweed, all kinds of butterflies love this plant. And that's why it's aptly named, you know, butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. It's the only native milkweed in Illinois that has orange flowers. It's the only native milkweed in Illinois that does not have milky sap, it actually has clear sap. And it also has alternate leaves, although some of the other milkweeds sometimes have alternate leaves as well, but most milkweeds have opposite leaves. So there's the butterfly milkweed, beautiful. We also have swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata, which as the name implies, likes wetlands, typically full sun, you know, ditches and things. Oh, I was driving to, um, I was driving across Interstate 64 in between Mount Vernon and St. Louis, and in the ditches along the interstate was just solid swamp milkweed. So, you know, the Illinois Department of Transportation is doing what they can to promote um, habitat for the monarch butterflies because a lot of people are concerned they may become federally endangered. And honestly, um, depending on who the landowner is, sometimes um, that does not help um, uh, the situation if, if, if you're a landowner. So we're trying to get ahead of the, the curve here and, and promote food for monarchs so that they do not become any uh, rarer. And swamp milkweed is a good one that grows in a variety of places there for them. Some other ones here, we have of course the common milkweed, which grows all over in old fields and roadsides and, and uh, pretty commonly across the landscape as the name implies. And it also wonderfully smelling blooms. If you've never smelled common milkweed and you see a bloom next year, go, you know, take a big whiff of those big flower heads and they are very pleasantly fragrant. Down here in the Southern part of the state, we get uh, the variegated milkweed, Asclepias variegated, sometimes called red ring milkweed because you see the little red ring around the flowers there, sort of underneath the, the, the petals. Um, I should mention also that, that milkweeds, Asclepias, has a very uh, complex floral structure. Um, so they, uh, they're, they're somewhat unique in, in how they're formed, and there's a lot going on there in the anatomy of the flower for milkweeds. And a couple other ones here, we have the tall green, Asclepias hertella, and the horsetail milkweed, Asclepias verticillata. So the tall green milkweed is fairly conservative in Chicago region. I think it's monitored in some places. And you can see the picture on the left has a nice monarch caterpillar that is on the tall green milkweed. In Southern Illinois, tall green milkweed is a roadside plant in a lot of cases. So it's not as conservative. And then what's sort of bizarre is the opposite is true for the horsetail milkweed. In Northern Illinois, the horsetail milkweed is kind of weedy. It's you know, low C value. It's, I've seen it in grow bloom you know, profusely along interstates and highways. In Southern Illinois, though, you really only find it on intact uh, limestone glades and in hill prairies and such. So much more conservative in Southern Illinois. Some other showy ones here, we have poke milkweed and purple milkweed. So the poke milkweed somewhat resembles poke weed. It's not a milkweed, totally different. I'm sure most of you have heard of poke weed. Uh, but the poke milkweed is somewhat looks similar, hence the name. It has got these white flowers, they're very sparsely flowering, not a very dense head, but a very um, neat looking shape to the flowers. I think they look like a little claw there with the horns that kind of protrude out of the, the flower. And then the purple milkweed, it's somewhat like common milkweed, but the flowers are larger and usually um, darker colored. But you can see there's a monarch caterpillar hiding out on the leaf there behind the flowers of the purple milkweed. I took that picture actually this year uh, in June. 
Now we have four leaf milkweed, which is the, the earliest milkweed to bloom in Illinois, Asclep Asclepius quadrifolia, right? Leaves of four. So sometimes people call this world milkweed. Sometimes the horsetail milkweed is called world milkweed. So I just avoided that term altogether. And one's horsetail milkweed and this one's four leaf milkweed. Uh, but it has a whorl of four leaves, typically somewhere on the stem, and they can have white to pinkish flowers, and they bloom in you know, open woodlands, so conservative early blooming milkweed. And then down here in the south, we get the white swamp milkweed, which is really common actually in um, the coastal plain and wetlands associated, you know, with the floodplains of the Mississippi River. Now, most milkweeds, have a seed capsule called a follicle. And the follicles are um, dihiscent, right? They, they crack and they open. And then that fluff attached to the seed comes out and they're wind dispersed, right? So the fluffy attachment allows for the seeds to blow through the wind and get dispersed. Now, white swamp milkweed does not have, it's the only milkweed in Illinois that does not have that cottony fluff attached to the seed because it grows in you know, dense forests, uh, dense floodplain forests and swamps. So there's not a lot of wind activity moving through those places. So these seeds are specially adapted for water dispersal. And so you see the picture there in the bottom that the, they have wings. The seeds have wings on the margin and that allows them to float on the surface of the water and then be dispersed that way. So a little different strategy there on the Asclepius perennis. Another beautiful one with larger flowers is the prairie milkweed, Asclepius sullivantii, which is, you know, in, as the name implies, in prairies, more on the northern half of Illinois. Always, um, I'm excited to find prairie milkweed, especially when blooming. I took that picture actually in Cook County years ago. And then some of the uh, green flowered ones, we have green milkweed, sometimes called short green milkweed. Uh, and then the green flowered milkweed, which is also sometimes called spider milkweed. So the short green milkweed is Asclepius veritiflora, even though veritiflora means green flowered. And the green flowered milkweed is Asclepius viridis, even though viridis means green. So it seems like the common names got a little switched up there and they seem backwards uh, according to the translation of the botanical name. But in any event, those are two additional milkweeds. And actually the, the green flower, the Asclepius viridis on the right side of the slide is also a pretty early flowering milkweed and not very common in Illinois. It's really just in a few counties in sort of the not, not as far south as unglaciated Illinois, but in the Southern Till Plain. So that's kind of neat where the short green milkweed likes really dry prairies and, and limestone glades and, and things like that. Now we have one that's restricted to sand. And in Illinois, there's just a few places where there's really um, a large amount of sand deposited. And that's where you'll find the sand milkweed, sometimes also called blunt leaf milkweed, Asclepius amplexicollis. It has a relatively um, few sets of leaves on the stem. And then you can see it's pretty sparsely flowered as well. And they you know, sort of have a a darker color there to the flower. So I don't see this plant that much, but when you're in sand, one to look out for. And then the rare milkweed. We have several pretty rare milkweeds in the state, like woolly milkweed. As the name implies, you see how hairy it is, Asclepius lanuginosa. And this also grows pra on prairies, dry gravel prairies, um, you know, dry habitats, and it is state listed as rare. So not a very easy one to find. I actually drove like four hours out of my way to photograph this when it was blooming. A friend works at a preserve and he let me know. And I was traveling up to Chicago and I went way out of my way to go see it, but it was worth it. And although this does grow and bloom in Chicago land as well, often these rare milkweeds are sterile. The population sizes are so small that they don't make seed, they flower, but nothing is pollinating them. Or even if they do get pollinated, they're inbred. So they don't produce viable seed. And that's one reason why they're quite rare. Um, and then here are the, the two rarest milkweeds of Illinois, Meads milkweed, which is on the left, which is a federally threatened species. And the oval leaf milkweed, Asclepius ovalifolia, which only occurs in Illinois at one site, 
and they're not doing very well, I heard, as of this year at that site. I took this photo in 2013, and I think it's a lovely photo, and I feel um, fortunate to have captured it because, at least in Illinois, this is not a species that will probably persist on the landscape for much longer, but we're trying. So that's one of our rarest, really, milkweeds in the state, the oval leaf one. So I'll end here with, with this quote for you to think about. Remnant landscapes inspire the artist and the poet to all manner of expressions of beauty. Indeed, caring for the land in and of itself is an endeavor that can heal our own fragile souls. Quote by Gerald Wilhelm, the author of The Flora of Chicago Region. So I will conclude my slideshow there. You are welcome to email me uh, if you have questions. And again, check out my website. Um, look at the plants there and check out the schedule and sign up for emails if you're interested in that. Uh, notice, uh, folks, that in November, uh, we are have a, a, a change of date. Instead of the fourth Thursday, it is the third. It's going to be on November 18th because of Thanksgiving. And this is a program, a program you absolutely do not want to miss, <clears throat> Backyard Wildlife by Stephen Barton. He is a spectacular photographer and gets all sorts of critters. He has a webcam in his backyard and you'll just be amazed at the kind of photos he gets of uh, whoever's visiting his yard. Uh, <clears throat> so you wanna make sure you see that. Um, he is a, a veterinarian, a herpetologist, and I'm not sure he sees many snakes in his yard, but he sure gets all the birds and he gets the birds, you know, with the berry in their mouth or, you know, whatever. So, so really a, a wonderful program. So like, uh, like Chris with his wonderful photos, they really make a difference when you can see the, the quality of, of uh, photography that you folks are doing. <clears throat>